نحمده و نصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاسالوا اهل الذكر ان كنتم لا تعلمون صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم انفعني بما علمتني وعلمني ما ينفعني رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي يا رب صلي وسلم دائما ابدا على حبيبك خير خلقك كلهم my respected young brothers and elders i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this gathering in his court and make it means of our forgiveness and may he give us the tawfiq to act upon what we hear, what we read, and bring it to, in our practice. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me the tawfiq to answer the questions in accordance with the Quran and Hadith. My respected young brothers, today also we have received some questions from brothers. The foremost question of today's session is how to pray on the chair. <coughs> the correct method of offering the prayer while sitting on the chair. And first of all, we should remember we shouldn't go for the option of sitting on the chair you know if somebody has you know just for minor excuses if somebody sits on the chair while he could do the sajda then his namaz will not be valid chair comes in when someone is in a such a condition his health is such a condition that he cannot do sajda at all then the masala is rather than sitting on a chair he should sit on the ground and if someone cannot even sit on the ground then he should sit on the chair now the common mistake is made when some when people are sitting on the chair and offering the prayer somebody asks the question how to do ruku and how to do sajda and where to keep our hands while we're doing sajda and while we're doing ruku now you have seen maybe you may, you may have seen people sit on the chair and how they do sajda but to do sajda first of all to do ruku and sajda we need to bow our head slightly down and when we do when doing a sajda then we need to bow our head a bit more and now some people what they do like the, your hands are on the thigh the hands should be on the thigh when you're doing ruku and when you're doing sajda. Now, what some people do when they when they bow their head for for ruku, they also stretch their hands forward. And when they bow their head for sajda, then they stretch a bit more in our head. This is wrong. We should keep our hands where they are on our on our laps, on our thighs, and then bow our head so, you know, slightly for down for uh, ruku and then more be more for sajda this is the method of offering the salah on the chair <clears throat> now there is another question someone asked regarding offering uh, sunnat fajr of you know, two sunnat fajr while the jamaat is going on the imam is leading the prayer somebody comes in the masjid and he hasn't read his sunnats so should he 
leave other sunnahs and join the imam or should he first offer the two sunnahs and then join the imam the masala is abdullah bin masood radiallahu ta'ala anhu once came to masjid and the imam was leading the prayer fajr so he stood at the side he offered his two rakat sunnah and then he joined the imam now prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a hadith he has prohibited us of offering any prayer after the performance of two farz of fajr now once we have read two farz of fajr after that till sun rise it is makru to offer any any optional prayer so when we come to the masjid and the imam is leading the fajr prayer and if we haven't read our two sunnahs first we should read our two sunnahs and then join the imam but if we come and the imam is sitting in the shahad and we fear that if i start my sunnahs and before i finish my sunnah the imam will finish his, he will give salam then we should leave out the sunnah and then join the imam and then we do the qada of these two sunnahs after the sunrise not after the fard prayer after sunrise <clears throat> somebody asked regarding do you still have to quietly recite surah fatiha when the imam is reciting this loudly or do you remain silent and just just listen to the imam when he is reciting surah fatiha loudly but the masala is regarding recitation of behind the imam our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as this hadith is narrated by Abu Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala who is it is in the Sunan Nasa'i a prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says the innamal imam li yu'tamma bihi fa idha kabbara fa kabbiru fa idha kabbara fa kabbiru wa idha qara'a fa ansitu rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says the imam is appointed that the people who are behind him they should follow him when he says when he says allahu akbar when he while, while he is going to the ruku then you should also softly say allahu akbar and when the imam begins his recitation then you should remain silent and in another hadith of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says man kana lahu imam fa qira'atu imami lahu qira'at the one who has imam meaning the one who is reading his prayer behind the imam then the recitation of imam will be sufficient for his muqtadis the muqtadis they will remain silent and they will not do the recitation anyhow this masala of recitation of surah fatiha behind the imam if this is imam abu hanifa rahimahullah you know he has these you know proofs evidences hadith that the one should not do the recitation but the other imam imam shafi rahimahullah according to him and the other imams one should read surah fatiha but anyhow if you follow the school thought of imam abu hanifa then there's no recitation behind the imam and if someone follows the school of thought of imam shafi rahimahullah imam muhammad bin hanbal or imam malik then he is allowed to do the recitation of surah fatiha behind the imam what dua to make for our future generation when we look at the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions regarding hazrat ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and hazrat ismail alayhi salatu wasalam they made a dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rabbana waj'alna muslimaina lak wa min dhurriyyatina ummatan muslimatan lak O oh Allah you make us to obedience to you and make our generation the coming generation obedient to you so this is a dua we should make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our coming generation that oh Allah make them muslim make them muslim make them your obedient to you and your rasul and we should make this dua rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurriyyatina qurrata a'yuni wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama this covers all your coming generation 
that oh Allah, you know, you make our uh, our spouses, our wives, and our children coolness of our eyes and make us the the Imam of Muttaqin. So this dua, you know, we should you know we should make it this Quran, Rabbi Jalni Mukhima Salati Wamin Zuriati. We should make this dua, and these duas will cover our coming generation, our children which we have now, and our offsprings will, will, will which are to come in our generation. So we should, you know, we should learn these duas. And as some muftiyani kram and ulama they say, you know, if if for a common people, if it's difficult to memorize these duas, just learn the translation. Just learn the translation and make the dua in your own in your own language. <coughs> In the field of tasawwuf, how can a person get ijazat from Sheikh and become Khalifa from Sheikh? Well, first of all, remember, one shouldn't get bad to someone with the need of becoming his Khalifa and having a need that he should give me ijazat and make me Khalifa. The whole purpose of you know making bad on someone's hand is that you know we are doing bad on his hand so that he can guide us and so that we can you know, reach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This should be our purpose, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to gain the pleasure, not to become uh, you know, his khalifa. And remember, if someone has this niyat that I am doing a bad on this muzrak, on this murshid, and his niyat is that he should make me a khalifa, remember, neither he will give you the khilafat, no, you will come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole purpose of making a bath on someone's hand is that we come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is nafs? How nafs tries to destroy a person, how to save ourselves from our real hidden and biggest enemy. When nafs is our own self, and there's a hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he addressed the Sahaba Ikram and he said, what do you think of a friend who if you treat him very well, and you look after him, but still he puts you into troubles. So the, the Sahaba Ikram, they said, O Prophet of Allah. Then, then he said, but he is such a friend, but if you insult him, and if you don't look after him, if you, if you insult your friend, this friend, then he will look after you. So the Sahaba Ikram, they said, O Prophet of Allah, you know, this type of friend you are mentioning, that if somebody you know, treats him good, but in return he doesn't treat him good, you know, he's, you know, he puts him to trouble. But if someone insults him, you know, then he does good things to you. So he said, the Sahaba said, you know, this, you know, this is the very worst, you know, enemy, a person. So Sahaba Rasulullah Sallallahu said, the one in whose control lies my life, such friend is your own self, which is inside you, your own nafs, which means, you know, like uh, sometimes when a person is ill and he, the, the doctor prescribes him a medicine and sometimes the, the ill person, you know, he doesn't want to take the medicine, but unwillingly he takes it. Similarly, you know, our nafs is in the nafs al ammaratun bisu. You know, this nafs, our, you know, the, our inner self, it always encourages to do, you know, you know, insights to evil, you know, you know, makes us do, you know, evil things. Now, we need to force ourselves. You know, we need to force, you know, you know when, in the, when a person wants to do something good and the nafs comes a barrier, it becomes a barrier and it doesn't let you do, you know, it makes you lazy. You know, you, could be, you become lazy. The, the solution is that we need to force ourselves to do the good deeds. This is the reality. We have to force ourselves. When we force ourselves, then if we keep on forcing ourselves for the good deeds, then what happens eventually, a time comes, then doing of good deeds becomes our second nature. But in the beginning stages, what happens, it is a bit difficult. 
you know, to read the prayers, to do the good deeds, we become, we become very lazy quickly and, you know, our nafs doesn't make us, you know, let us do good things and if we don't force ourselves, then we will, we will become lazy and then we will become prey of our own nafs and he, the nafs will overcome us. It will, it will be dominant over us. So we need to force ourselves as we force when we are ill and take the medicine. We don't want to take it, but you know we have to take it. You know, thinking that you know this is for the you know for the, my own self. You know, I'll get better by taking the medicine. Similarly, if we force ourselves for the good deeds, slowly but slowly, what will happen? Then this very nafs will be in our favor and then we you know we will very easily do the good deeds but in the, in the in the beginning stages it will be hard but if we if we continue continue forcing ourselves for the good deeds then a time comes then all the good deeds will become very easy for us <clears throat> they say normally in houses bathroom that in the toilet is in the and the the bathtub and the toilet together. So the person goes and makes wudu. So is he allowed to read dua before wudu, duration of wudu? The masala is when we are in in a bath where the, you know the, the toilet is there as well and if we are making wudu and the duas are read uh, duration of wudu, you know, or the or before re starting our wudu, Bismillah is read. So should we read it verbally or should we read it in our mind? The ulama, they say while we are there in a toilet, I mean in the bathroom where the toilet is as well, we should read the duas in our minds. We should read duas in our mind. We should read Bismillah in our mind, duas in our mind, no verbally. <clears throat> Men are required to wear prayer hut while offering salah. Are men required to wear them all the time? What is the sunnah? The sunnah is to wear the hut all the time. It is a sunnah. It is an established sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu to the extent when a Prophet Sallallahu used to go to relieve himself, he used to wear, he used to cover his head. Meaning when we go to the toilet, we should wear our hut. Even when we go to the toilet, we should wear a hut. And wearing a hut all the time, it is sunnah. You know, some people sometimes we find they restrict, you know, some masalas to something. You know, sometimes people think in the prayer, you know, the, some people you see, they fold their trousers and they, then they uncover their ankles in, in the prayer. And when they're not in the prayer, then they just cover the ankles. But, you know, this masala of, uh, you know, keeping the ankles uncovered, it is not only for the prayer, it is for all the time. You know, it is all the time that we should keep our ankles uncovered. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, in the Hadith, he has given a, a warning to those people who cover their ankles, that their ankles will burn in hellfire. So, wearing a hut, it is not only restricted to the prayer, it is sooner to wear at all times. <clears throat> But here somebody asked a question regarding what happened to the tribe of Banu Qurayza. And he's asking that the, the Quran talks about this even in Surah Ahzab verse 26. I heard that the boys and their bodies checked to see if they have pubic hair and the one that did were killed and boys grow pubic hair at the age of 13, 14. I also read that between 400 to 900 men were beheaded. I am the men, I mean, I, pretty, I am pretty sure not all those 400 to 900 were, were, were soldiers and the Prophet wasallam ordered them to be you know, executed. Well, the Muslim regarding here, first of all, in Banu Qurayza, it happened after the Ghazwai Ahzab when our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he came back when all the forces got together about 12,000 or 15,000 and Muslims were 13,000 and when the Sulas and they all ran off and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent the wind 
and the angels came and they cast fear and awe in their hearts and they all run, run away. And Prophet Sallallahu he came back and Jibreel Alayhi he said, have you come back? He said, yes. I, have you all disarmed yourself? He said, yes. He said, we haven't, the angels. Go, go to, go to Banu Kreza and, and fight them. But Banu Kreza, it was the, it was the Jewish tribe. Banu Kreza was a Jewish tribe. And what they did, you know, they had a peace, uh, a treaty with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what happened when all the forces together, you know, when all the forces, you know, like all the, 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 the Meccans, chiefs and, the, and all the tribes, they got together uh, with the intention to finish off all the Muslims. What Banu, Banu Quraiza did, they, they betrayed, deceived Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because they had a, a peace treaty with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you are in difficulties, we will help you. And if we are in difficulties, you Muslims will help, help us. But what happened when all the tribes got together, Banu Quraiza also joined them. They betrayed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he handed over their matter to Saad bin Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala. He said, whatever you will make a decision about them, I will accept it. Why? Because, you know, these two the Ansars, they belonged to two tribes, Aus and Khazraj. And Saad bin Mu'ad was from the tribe of Aus. Now, Aus, this tribe, they had, you know, good relation with Banu Quraiza in the days of Jahiliyyah. So, Hadrati Saad bin Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala, who he said to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, my decision is regarding them, that their men should be killed. Now, now this person was asking me a question that, you know, not all of them were fighting against Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Let me tell you one thing, maybe for your information, for everyone's information. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was informed by Jibreel alayhi wa that go, and fight them, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa first, he sent his Sahaba Ikram and he sent Ali radiallahu ta'ala with, 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 with the flag of Islam. When Ali radiallahu ta'ala went to them, you know what they did? They used foul language against Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which it in itself, you know, it is unforgivable for sin, you know, you know, this is sin was that, you know, should not be no one should be pardoned if somebody you know, swears at Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They swore at Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They used foul language about, against Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Ali Radiallahu Ta'ala went there. So this, you know, sin itself was something that, you know, they, they you know, they, they were not someone who should be forgiven. So uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to Mu'az, uh, Sa'ad bin Mu'az, their matter is in your hand, you make a decision. He said, Prophet Allah, my decision is, there is, Men should be should be killed, and their women, their children, they should be taken as slaves. So this is the this is the correct information. Only not four to nine hundred. There were only four hundred men. They were they were killed. Why? Because they betrayed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they used foul language against Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not the children, nor their women. Uh, did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam torture his wife Safiya bint Huayy, his uh, ex-husband Ali Azabillah? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, the person asking, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tortured our, his wife uh, Safiya, his uh, ex-husband. But well, remember, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, this Hazrat uh, Safiya, uh, she she was from the Jewish tribe, and she belonged to the tribe Banu Nadir and this information that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tortured her ex-husband it's incorrect how can we think of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam torturing anyone you know he never ever tortured anyone now her husband first of all remember she when she was uh, before she became Muslim before she came became our Prophet's wife you know she married to Salam and he divorced her and then she married to Kanana and now Kanana when in the in the battle of Khaybar he was killed and then Hadrat Safiya she became a captive you know she became you know the the, 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 the war prisoner and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam she came in her share uh, in his share and he 
he freed her and then Prophet married her. And this information that Rasulullah tortured her ex-husband, it is incorrect. He, he was killed in the battle of Khaybar. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's it. <coughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our city here. Allah wa salli ala Sayyidina wa mawlana Muhammadun wa lalihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallim. Ya Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatun fi al-akhirati hasanatun wa kina da'a al-nar. Allahumma Rabbana taqabal minna inna kanta sami wa lalim. Wa tuba alayna inna kanta tubaab al-rahim. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi Muhammadun wa lalihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. برحمتك يا رحم رحم <تصفيق>